Hello, and welcome to Sobercast. We provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Also, if you're a member of NA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, NAPOD. NAPOD features NA speakers and workshops in the same format as Sobercast. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for NAPOD, N-A-P-O-D, all one word, on any podcast player app, or go to NAPOD.XYZ if you'd like to listen online. Hope you enjoy the podcast and have a great day. of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any set, denomination, politics, organization, or institution, does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. This is a speaker meeting. I'll speak for 10 minutes and then turn the meeting over to our main speaker, Jeff, who will share his experience, strength, and hope. Okay, I will start. Um, okay, my name is Ellie. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I'm super nervous because I want you guys to think I'm cool, uh, but <laughs> uh, the truth is, is that what I'm attracted to in a speaker in, meeting, um, in meetings is honesty, you know, so I'm just going to try to be as honest as I can. Uh, I was aware of AA uh, a long time before I got sober. My parents are sober, and so um, I've been in meetings since I was really little. And I was really attracted to what they had in meetings, actually, and I really liked being in them, even before I started drinking when I was like 10 and 11, you know? Um, because these, these sober people had, uh, like, they had, like, power, you know what I mean? And they were really free, and it was, I was attracted to their happy joyousness, you know? And I didn't know it at the time, but I, I wanted to end up in AA, okay? <laughs> so I went out when I was like 12, uh, <coughs> It's all set to, to be an alcoholic, you know? Um, I had my first drink when I was 13. Uh, it's not really a big deal. I got super drunk. It was like that for the rest of my drinking. Um, I went to the Gilman a lot, uh, and I just would, like, hang out outside and, um, and drink. And it was like, I just desperately wanted to be a part of um, this group. You know what I mean? But I felt so out of place, and that's always been... Uh, what it's been like for me is that it's just like, I'm so uncomfortable and I basically, I totally hate myself, right? And like think I'm a piece of shit and, um, and just totally restless, irritable and discontent. And like, uh, when I'm in a situation, it's just who I am without a solution is, uh, I'm, I'm anxious and everything I say, I say it and I'm like, that was fucking so stupid. I sound like an idiot. These people hate me. And I basically think that people hate me, you know? And so uh, I went to high school, and um, I was just a real good teenage alcoholic, basically. I started drinking on the, the train to school, and I went to this art school in San Francisco, and I got accepted for creative writing, which is something that I like, really like to do, you know, and I, like, wanted to do well in this school, and I had this teacher who, like, thought I had potential and wanted me to do well. Um, and I had every intention of doing well, you know, but this creative writing class that I did uh, was right after lunch, so it's like, what are you going to do, you know? Um, and it was just like, I just had, I would drink in the morning, I, I could buy alcohol in the city, um, and I would get vodka and then drink on the Muni, just on the way to school, and I would get fucked up at lunch, and, um, you know, it was fucked up. I would go into this class uh, really fucked up and be so full of, um, like, shame and... Um, 
and just like total hatred for myself and like I couldn't believe that I had like done this again, you know. Um, and what it looked like for me at the end was just like I totally humiliated myself. I was obsessed with this identity of like being, um, being like the most fucked up, you know what I mean? So it was like I uh, tried really hard and like I wanted people to know and I wanted people to see me drunk because it was like I hated everything about who I was, and so that's who I wanted to be. Um, and so I was just, I had so much shame, and my I was so sick of my parents uh, having to, they would get called all the time and have to come and get me, and I would be falling over and drunk and, like, bleeding and way out in Oakland and passed out and stuff, and it was so humiliating. Um, and basically it was, like, alcohol um, when it worked, what it helped me do is just to stop thinking about myself. You know what I mean? Because I have the most intense self-obsession, and it's it's really painful to have to think about yourself all the time and how much you hate yourself. Um, and so it would free me of that and help me just be free of, of, of self and just let go of um, my fear. And, like, I just had crippling fear about being around people. Like, I would be in conversations with these girls, like, in school and stuff, who I thought were really cool, and I wanted them to like me, and their dads let them drink at their house, so I wanted to be their friend. And then I would be talking to them, and it would be like, I would be unable to speak because I was so terrified. Um, and that's horrible, right? That's horrible. And so it was like, when I was drunk, I could just, like, not care. And that's so, it was such a beautiful thing, right? But it, it stopped working, and what would happen is that I would drink, and I would um, still be miserable, and I would, like, black out or pass out or whatever, but um, I would just, like, be crying, and it wouldn't be a fun time, and it was, like, I, I wasn't partying, you know? I was, like, drinking in the bathroom stall before physics class, and then, like, <laughs> going to physics and then going back to the bathroom, like, 17 times because I wasn't drunk enough, and then, um, so whatever. What happened, basically, is that uh, I drank all the time. I got fucked up every day. I had so much shame about it. I basically wanted to kill myself. I pretty much hoped that I would jump in front of a train when I was in a blackout, you know? Um, and this one night, uh, I was with my friends, and we were, I had, like, stolen all their alcohol, and um, they weren't drunk, and I was drunk, and they were like, you really have a problem. Like, this is really fucked up. And I was like, be like, you need to stop drinking. And I was like, no, no, you don't understand, like, when I start drinking and you take it away from me, it's, like, physically painful for me. They didn't get it. They thought that was really fucked up and weird. Um, so I, uh, someone I know said that um, he thinks that alcoholics will take their first chance to get sober, and that was my experience totally. Um, I heard that, and I was like, yeah, it's, it's true. You know, I don't want to do this anymore. I just can't go on. I was so tired of it. It's so hard to drink. I mean, especially when you're underage, you know? But it's like, it's so hard to be drunk all the time. And I was exhausted. And I was sick all the time. And I felt bad. Um, and so I called this woman I had known since I was really little. And I told her I thought I was an alcoholic. And so she brought me to a meeting the next day. Um, and I have a lot of experience with relapse. Because for like the first two months that I was in AA, I, uh, I just, I wasn't able to get 30 days together, you know? And I had this experience where it was like, I had every intention of being sober, and I went to this park to hang out with my friends, and they were drinking, and I just found myself drunk. I kid you not. I mean, it was like, I wanted to be sober. You know, I had nine days sober, and I was in AA, and I was going to meetings, and it was just like, it was like an out-of-body experience, like seeing myself drink, and then I was um, blacked out, and I like came to, and I was like in the sober house at, uh, on Bancroft, in the bathroom, like around the toilet, like, throwing up and saying like, this isn't fun, this isn't fun, why do I keep doing this, you know? And it was like, that was just an experience of, um, of total powerlessness. I was totally powerless. And uh, and what's so amazing, and I had such a rough time with this, is um, it's like higher power, you know? I had such a hard time, like, believing in God, and I was so freaked out about God and, like, and like church and Jesus. And I thought the whole thing was weird. And the truth is, is that it's like, I was at this place where I just didn't care anymore. You know what I mean? I was like, fine, like, I give up. Like, I'll turn it over. I can't fucking handle this, you know? And um, I don't even know if I can say that I believe in God, but I've had an experience of God, right, where it's like I was so powerless. I couldn't do it, and yet I have, like, a year sober. You know what I mean? So it's like 
like how could I even deny that that's, there's not some greater power working uh, for me because I haven't had to pick up. And what's so beautiful is that it's like um, who I am without uh, without alcohol or without these steps is um, fucking self-hating. I, I can't be here. I don't want to be here, right? I want to like just escape. And um, my brain hurts me. It's like it like creates misery. It's like it takes things and thinks about them and thinks about them and thinks about them. Um, until I'm in this, like, gnarly rut of obsession, and I can't get out of it, right? And it's like, that's when a drink or killing myself starts feeling real appealing. Um, but I'm very grateful that someone, um, my understanding trust with this person, or, you know, my sponsor, um, has showed me a way to continue in these steps. So it's like, I've worked the steps, and then every day I continue to do 10, 11, 12. So I wake up in the morning, and I take an inventory, and I meditate, just so that I can start out the day with the shit not going already, you know? And um, it's a really beautiful thing. I have an action that I can take to turn it over. So it's like I put my fears and resentments on paper, and, and I'm, I'm giving it to God. I'm turning it over, right? And I can just, like, surrender that stuff so that it's removed from me, and I can face it and be rid of it and not um, not have my fear define me because I'm not my inventory. You know what I mean? Like, like we're just perfect children of God. And I know that sounds real intense, but that's, that's the truth is that it's like I'm not all this fear and shit, you know? Like, I'm... I'm okay without it, and um, and that's removed from me, and I'm able to just be in this world, and I'm able to just self-forget, and that's that's all I want, is to just not think about myself all the time, um, and so, like, self-love and everything is great, but when I'm happy, I'm in self-forgetting, and that's when I'm not thinking about myself, and that's when I'm able to carry this message, um, oh my god, I'm, like, out of time already, <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, you know, I have something to do every day. I have uh, a solution that it's, a, it's as good as alcohol, you know, because if it wasn't, I would drink. It's like, I'm not here to, like, be in sobriety and be miserable. You know, I just want to be happy. And so it's like, I'll really do whatever makes me happy. Um, and so it's it's total proof that, that it's worth it, right? Because it's like, I'm still here, you know? I'm not drunk. And it's like, I'm happy on a regular basis, which I can't even believe, like, the idea that I would be okay and like, and basically not want to kill myself all the time is such a fucking gift. And it's like, when I actually say it, I mean, it's pretty intense. I can't even believe it. Um, <laughs> and so it, anyway, yeah, I, uh, I'm able to, uh, surrender my fears on paper, um, see conscious contact with a higher power, you know? Um, and then I meditate afterwards so that I can I can continue to be in that conscious contact, and then I can go out into the world and um, and be like a present member of society. And there's like all this great stuff that's come with my sobriety, right? Which is like I like am learning how to have relationships with people, and like I have a like trusting, honest uh, dynamic with my parents, you know. Um, but that stuff matters to me so much less than just like being okay in this world, you know. Um, like, I, I told my mom when I was 15, like, uh, I hate myself, and I love drinking, like, you know, and that really freaked her out. But, um, <laughs> but what it really was is that it was, like, not even that I love drinking, but that I just love the, um, the spirit, you know what I mean? Because lack of power is our dilemma, and I crave spirit. I don't have that thing that makes normies just, like, be okay. Like, they're just okay. Like, they're just happy, and everything's fine. I don't have that. Everything feels like um, everyone's going to find out that I'm actually a piece of shit or they're going to, like, discover that they don't really like me and then they're going to, like, exclude me and I'm, like, going to be alone and, like, super depressed and, like, not have the power to leave my bed, you know, which happens. Um, but I, fi- I have power um, out of these steps and I can do it and it's, like, I, I take them and I, I can read my inventory and have a uh, reflection with this woman, you know, who's, like, also an alcoholic and have reflection with my alcoholic fellows, and that's really what I crave, you know, is just, um, just, like, spirit and, and honesty and this, uh, this, like, honest, like, we're not alone, you know what I mean? Like, how beautiful is that? That it's, like, I really thought, um, I really, like, hoped that I was, like, bipolar or schizophrenic or something, so there would be, like, a name for what I had, because I felt like I was so alone and so insane, and, um, it's such a gift that I get to be here, you know, and, like, and, like, find these rooms full of people who are just like me, uh, so I hope that was okay, uh, anyway, I'm out of time, but, um, I'm so grateful to be able to be raised in this program, thank you.
Um, okay, now I'd like to turn the meeting over to tonight's main speaker, Jim. <coughs> My name is Jim, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> Want if I could do that at the age of 16 or 17. My God, that's fantastic to be so honest and to be so forthcoming. I really appreciate that. Can you imagine if I'd have gotten sober at that age? <laughs> I might have become the president of AA. <laughs> we have a president in AA, don't we? I mean, I think we do. It, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank. Oh, you raised your hand. Jenny. Nice. He's from Akron, so he thinks he's the president. That's all. <laughs> Hey, thanks, Pat, for inviting me. I really appreciate it. And welcome to those of you who are just starting out on this adventure. I'm sorry I sound froggy. Can you hear me in the back? My story starts uh, in New York City in the Bronx where I was born and raised. <clears throat> I'm the oldest of four children, three boys, and my uh, the girl is at the bottom, the sister. And the two boys below me are both deceased. One as a result of alcoholism and the other as a result of violent lifestyle in the Bronx. And that's how the Bronx used to be many years ago. Uh, I first started to drink at the age of 15, maybe 16. I drank in a bar, a neighborhood bar, right across the street from the Yankee Stadium. I was raised about seven blocks from there. And I was working in uh, an ice cream bar. <coughs> and the old soda jerk stories are long gone, so we shouldn't use that anymore. And many of you may not even know what a soda jerk is, but I worked at an ice cream parlor across the street from the stadium, and I worked after school hours, after high school, and I worked with men who were older, and they were working part-time jobs, and they used to use that money to pay off the bookmakers and the Shylocks, and that was, again, the lifestyle in the Bronx, and that's how you were raised. Uh, if you read The Merchant of Venice, you'll know a little bit about that. And I drank there, and I, I know right away, as soon as I was able to drink, and as soon as I was able to keep things down... I was immediately in love with myself. I felt that everything was fantastic. I could do anything I wanted to do. I mean, I could dance. I could talk to women. I could do whatever I wanted to do. I really felt that I was better than you when I drank alcohol. First couple of times I got sick. But after that, it was kind of the elixir of the gods. It made me everything that I thought I wasn't. I did marry with that for, for a couple of years. And at the age of 17, 17 and a half, I was coming up against some problems in the city and decided to take my first what I know to be geographic. And I joined the Navy at 17 and a half with, with parents' permission. My first duty station was in San Diego and then over overseas on a ship. Uh, and I was in Japan at, at 18 years old. And coming from the Bronx and having led somewhat of a sheltered life, you know, being in Japan was like crazy. I mean, although my father was a practicing alcoholic, who died sober 10 years in the fellowship in New York. But at the time I was growing up as the oldest, he was active in his drinking. And I'd have to go into the bar on pay nights and get the check from him sent in there by my mother. And that's how I became normal and it became just part of life doing things like that. But when I got in the Navy and I got overseas, you know, the Navy didn't care what I did with my free time as long as I did my job during the day. So I had no parental supervision. And I didn't know what to do with myself, so I drank. And I learned how to drink, you know, and before I went to school, if there was a course called Barology, I would have passed because I always fancied myself a bar drinker. And I drank an awful lot in the Navy, got in trouble twice around the misuse of alcohol in the Navy. But both times I got away with it because sailors in the 60s, if you can relate that far back, in the 60s, sailors were expected to drink. So, you know, if you didn't commit a crime or kill somebody, usually you got away with it. And I did. Did a tour of duty in Vietnam before I got out, but it was not traumatic for me. I was in the Tonkin Gulf, and I didn't come back with uh, PTSD or any of the other ailments that a lot of my colleagues and friends did. I was getting ready to get out of the Navy at about 22 years of age, and a friend of mine lived in San Francisco, and he said, what are you going to do when you get out? And I said, well, I'm going to go back east, and our family was in the moving and storage business. Both brothers were still alive then, and I said, I'll probably go into the family business and be a warehouseman or be a moving and storage guy. And he said, well, why don't you come up to San Francisco and spend some time with me before you go back? And I said, how will I make a living? He said, well, I'll teach you how to tend bar. Well, that, that, that worked for me because I knew, you know, that I, I was 22 then, 20, 22, maybe 23. I knew that bartenders drank and you could drink for free. You know, and then bartender would know another bartender in another bar, and blah, 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 blah. So I said, okay, I'll do that. So I come up to San Francisco. And we worked in a bar called the Round Table, which is between 
uh, Eddie and Turk on Leavenworth in the Tenderloin in San Francisco. The Tenderloin in the 60s, you know, if you came from the Bronx, it was normal. It wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Tenderloin was not bad at all. As a matter of fact, I felt like I thrived in the Tenderloin. You can, you can imagine that. You know, it wasn't as bad as it is now. I mean, in those days, it was a little bit different. I like to think it wasn't bad. Anyway, so I worked, I attended a bar down there for a couple of years, and, and it didn't dawn on me until I got sober. Uh, actually, a few years into sobriety, when I realized that I worked at the round table, which was right next door to a bar called the Square Chair. And I never put the two together. You know, the chair, you know, that's the kind of drunk that I was. I just never took the time to look at things like that. And so I stayed there for a few years, and I got involved with some real violent stuff and ended up in the hospital for a few weeks. And that was my first spiritual awakening. You know, I took my geographic to the, uh, to out of New York to get to the West Coast, and my first spiritual intervention, you know, my higher power, and I was raised Catholic, uh, put his hand on my shoulder and said, well, you don't need to be in the Tenderloin anymore. And I somehow I think went back down there one time for some reason and then left again and didn't go back to the Tenderloin. And I had never finished high school. So I went back and I got my equivalency diploma and I went on to college and got all kinds of degrees and worked at the boys club. I mean, where did all this come from? I have no idea except my higher power, which I believe in. And now I'm working at the boys club and then the juvenile court. I take an application for the city and county of San Francisco. And while I'm going for the graduate degree, I worked in the jail section of the, of the juvenile court up on Woodside in San Francisco. And I was a turnkey, a jailer. We worked there nights. And we used to, during the daytime, we would, uh, we would just go to school. And everything was going along fine. I was raising a family. I was married by that time. I found the morning drink because I'd work 11 to 7. And I used to get discouraged. You know, people would say to me, gee, you know, you're married, you have children, and you're going to school all day and you're working at nights. You know, how can you do all that? And I started to feel sorry for myself because I'm a sensitive alcoholic, you know? <laughs> so we used to find the morning drink. We'd get off work at 7 o'clock in the morning and we'd go ahead and drink down at the Wishing Wells or any of the places in, in the West Portal area. And that's how I found the morning drink. I, I left the juvenile court and went into the probation department and did that for a while. And I used to drink during lunch hour. And the person that I drank with was a supervisor, had been there for many, many years, and was well entrenched in the system. I only had a few years as a probation officer, so I knew that if I got caught drinking, like for long two-hour lunch hours, which he didn't do, that I would get fired, because I didn't have the seniority he had. So I took a leave of absence from the court, and I went into a field where there's very little drinking, and that's the construction field. <laughs> and I got a license, became a contractor, and did a lot of that kind of work. Then I got involved in politics and got elected to public office and served my community as a, as a, as a council member. And I remember thinking, you know, I, my ego was such that I was drinking quite a bit <clears throat> and wearing a three-piece suit. And I, I would drink, but I wouldn't drink in the city that I governed because that didn't make sense. Now, if you can picture the peninsula... There are 20 contiguous cities. I mean, it's boom, 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 boom. I mean, there's no big walls between the cities. So instead of drinking in my city, I drank in the city next door. I mean, as if you know, nobody could see me there. I mean, you know, I mean that's, that's the drunk that you inherited when I got here. My drinking got worse and worse. As we know, it's progressive. And I don't want to tell you the war stories, so I want to get into, into the sober part of my life. But there was a lot of uh, wows kind of stuff. You know, and it was a lot of fun in the beginning. And then, like we hear, it's fun with problems. And then near the end, it became problems. Uh, in 71, my wife said to me, you know, and she's still my wife to this day, thank God. In 71, she said to me, you know, you got to get help for your drinking. You don't drink like normal people. You know, she was a teetotaler. She never drank. One time, I think we tried to, we tried to smoke marijuana together. <laughs> and she, I smoked cigarettes at the time, and she never smoked, so she couldn't do that. And I didn't care for the marijuana. So I'm just a straight drunk. But she said to me, you know, you got to get help for yourself. So she called San Francisco AA. We were living in the city then. And she had me 12 step by some attorney who's long since passed. So he took me to a couple of meetings in San Francisco, up around Judah Street, a couple of the churches. And I went to meetings on and off for a few months. And I'd go to one meeting and they'd say, how much time do you have? I'd say six months. I'd go to another meeting, I'd say two days. I mean, I just, you know. <laughs> As I look around, I'm more of the senior citizen compared to you. But when I got there at 71, you were all so much older than I was. I mean, I was a kid then, for God's sakes. And you know, I just couldn't be bothered. I just, truth of the matter was, I wasn't ready. 
So knowing that I'm an alcoholic and admitting it in 1971, I didn't get back to you until 1986. That's 15 years. You know, and if you know you're an alcoholic and you drink for an existing 15 years, that's pretty sick, you know? But I carried a badge, so a lot of times I didn't get in trouble. You know, today those things wouldn't work. I mean, you badge or no badge, they would take you in and go to jail. But in those days, things were a little bit more flexible. I did an awful lot of drinking on the peninsula. Uh, my father was a periodic alcoholic, God rest his soul. And I remember he would show me times when he'd have money in the safe, and he'd have a lot of money there. And he'd say, I haven't had a drink in six months, look what I've saved. You know, then he'd go on a, a one-week binge, and we'd have to go get the check at, at, you know, out of the office and stuff like that, out of the bars. I remember one time in South San Francisco, and uh, I had been to a long lunch, and I was drinking three-piece soup, because I'm the professional, and I'm the elected official. And uh, I go into my favorite bar where my best friend at the time was the owner, and he was tending bar. And I always admired that he never drank behind the bar when he tended bar. He tended the daytime and I always admired that, but I would never tell him that, because that would make him as good as or better than me, and I didn't want that to happen. So I go all sitting in there one day with half a heat on, and he's behind the bar, and this friend of ours is sound asleep on the couch in the middle of the bar. And I said, Bob, how could you let somebody sleep in your bar like that? What the hell is wrong with you? I'm a big official guy, right? You're a big shop. You're going to ruin your business. What the hell is wrong with you? And I made him feel, feel as bad as I could, because... If I made you feel bad, I felt better. Than, I felt superior to you. And I really ragged on you for about five, ten minutes. It wasn't six months till I was the guy sleeping on that couch. <laughs> you know, what goes around comes around. That's so true. Uh, I had uh, day books, calendars, <clears throat> uh, day minders from, from those days near the end of my drinking. And I would have all kinds of appointments, maybe 10 or 12 appointments during the day. And then there'd be two or three white pages where I would not book any appointments, whether it was political or business appointments, because I would have a luncheon or a dinner before those white pages with people who drank like I drank. You know, and that would be a three hour lunch. You know, when we finished lunch, it was into the evening cocktail hour, you know, and then I was off and running. And I knew that the next two or three days, I'd be out of it. I'd be drinking. And that's what I did. And I still kept a couple of those books with those white pages. My wife kept it on the calendar. Unbeknownst to me, she had been going to Al-Anon near the end. <laughs> and she would check off the days, you know, that, that I was out drinking. And it was sad. Near the end of my drinking, <clears throat> when I picked up the first drink in a bar, I was a bar drinker, never drank at home. When I picked up the first drink, I never knew when I would pick up the last drink on that binge. I used to say euphorically, a run, I was on a run. But they were binges, two or three days. You pick up the first drink, you get that taste in my mouth. I never knew when I would be in, that last drink would come from the binge. It's a sick way to live. And all during the binge, although I'm high and I'm having a great time, quote unquote, I'm thinking to myself, this has got to end soon. I have to, I have to stop this soon. I've got to do this, I've got to do that. I never really enjoyed those binges, although I drank through them. Yeah, I didn't realize till I got to Alcoholics Anonymous and had been here for a while that my friends in the bar, you know, consumed, it seemed, much more alcohol than I. And I'm a big man. I can drink a lot, or I could at the time. And I would pass out on that couch or pass out in the back room. And I'd get up and these bums would still be going. And I never understood how they did that until somebody told me about the white powder they were using. <laughs> so that's how they had their endurance. They were able to keep going. It was amazing. And that was my first resentment in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> that I never used the white powder so that I could drink more. Can you imagine, had I been able to use that, had I been exposed to that? What an idiotic thing. What a way to think. I was on one of my binges. And one of the things I did when I was on a binge near the end of my drinking, it was something that it, I came to, to realize why I was doing it later. It was my insecurities. I would go out and I'd drink. Let's say I started for lunch, <clears throat> expecting to be home for dinner at 5 or 6. Now it's 8 or 9 o'clock at night. My wife has already gone home. She had her own business, a barbering business. And so I would call her at 9 o'clock and say, where are you? You know, that kind of thing. And I'd say, well, I'm doing a big business deal. Everything was always a big deal with me, you know, drama. <laughs> I said, I'm in the middle of this big so-and-so, you know. 
No. Are well, you coming home? Yeah, I'll be home within two hours. You know, and then around 12, 30, 1 o'clock, I call her again. I say, you know, I, I'm too drunk to drive. I'm going to stay down here at so-and-so's house or something like that. Well, I'll come get you. No, no, that's all right. Don't, you know, I'm, I'll stay over here. I'll see you in the morning. Yeah. And then she'd get up and go to work in the morning. She had her own business. And around 10, 11 o'clock the next morning, I'm just getting my second wind, having slipped or crashed wherever I'm crashing and having a couple of drinks to make myself feel better. I would call her at 10 or 11 before my speech was slurred so she wouldn't think I was drinking. And I'd say, she'd say, what's going on? I'd say, listen, I don't want to explain to you on the phone. I'll tell you all about it when I get home. But I'll, I'll be home in a couple hours. I gotta and then I would just keep drinking. And then another six or seven hours to go by, and I called her again. And it didn't dawn on me until I was in AA that I kept calling because somewhere along the line, someone had said to me, one of my buddies in the bar, that they went home and the house was cleaned out. The wife had left. And I was always worried that I wouldn't have a place to go when I finished drinking. So I kept calling to make sure she was still there. Because if I called you at 10 o'clock in the morning, I know she couldn't have the house empty by 5. <laughs> yeah. So if I called at 5 and she was, you know, I mean, that's, you know, I, I, had, I had an education, so I had academia, I had book knowledge. But sometimes common sense didn't always slip into my, to my brain. On my last binge, my next to last binge, uh, I haven't gone for three days, and I get home, and I snuck in at three o'clock in the morning, knowing she's sleeping, so she has to get up in the morning, and I get in the big bed, and I'm, you know, and I got to stink, although I took showers and had extra clothes. Still, you know, after a while, it's bad. So I crawled to bed, and I'm quiet as I can be. And she had this little ritual where in the morning, she would get up, and she would make a lot of noise, to make sure that I woke up so she could yell. And she said, any bitty thing, she's, I think, five foot one. If five footer, she's that. And I'm a pretty good sized guy. And this time she was lecturing me. And she was sitting on the corner of the bureau in the bedroom and she was doing this. You know, she had never done that before. I could just sense that she was serious and that if I didn't have the right answers or didn't do the right thing, she was going to throw me out. You know, now I'm sitting in bed and I'm thinking to myself, where am I going to live if she throws me out? My mind was so wet with booze. I couldn't think straight. You know, we had income property. I couldn't live any place. I had money. I couldn't live in a hotel. You know, what are my friends on the city council going to think? My colleagues, if they hear my wife threw me out, and they would certainly hear because that kind of stuff spreads pretty fast. You know, I could not think clearly. You know, I was so booze logged in my head. You know, just so tired of drinking and just so up to here with everything. And the tears started to flow because I'm depressed from three days of drinking. Now here's this big hulk of a man sitting in bed, this little woman going like this, and the tears are rolling down my face. And she said to me, she, her, she said, get help or get out. I said, yeah, I'll get help. You know, that, 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 that wasn't so bad. And she said to me, there's this woman, so-and-so, I don't want to mention her name, at Peninsula Hospital, Mills Hospital, and she does the treatment program in and out patient. I want you to give her a call. Okay, we're going to take a trip for eight days with the extended family, so when I come back, I'll, no, no, you call her now. Uh, backed against the wall, but I'm an alcoholic. I can handle it. So she gives me the phone number, and I, she gets her she gets her on the phone, and I talk to her. Her name is Marilyn. I'll give you the first name. And she said, uh, "Blah blah blah." We talked, and I said, "Yeah, we're going to take this eight or ten day vacation. It's already been planned. And she's right here. Uh, I'm not going to drink on the on the trip, and I wouldn't because I didn't. I was a bar drinker. I'm not going to drink with the family. Besides, I'm very sick. And I, I said, when I come back, I'll come down. And I'll see. You. She said, "Well, you must have heard that story a thousand times." So I said, "Okay, fine." <clears throat> You know, and she said to me, how long are you drinking on this binge? I said, three days, pretty much on and off around the clock, except when I pass out. She said, it's an awful lot of booze. She said, you know, be careful that you don't go into convulsions because you're going to stop cold turkey with the alcohol and your system is used to the alcohol. You'll have convulsions. You'll have a grandma seizure. You know, and I'm foggy, but I can hear those things, you know. <laughs> and she said to me, uh, well, listen, if you feel the need that you're going to get sick, take a shot, take a drink that'll calm your nerves. I had heard that before. They call them hummers or something. I had heard that. They'd give it to you in the service. They'd give you little shots of something. With them. I said, okay, fine. I hang up. And my wife said to me, well, what did she say? I said, I'm going to see her when I get back from the trip. Anything else? Yeah, she said I could have tremors or I could get sick and that I should take a drink if I need it. Well, now, my wife believed in this woman, so she said, well, you know, all right. 
She goes off to work, and I'm thinking, that wasn't so bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a license to drink. And nothing. You know, I listen to the words in between the words. You know? you know, they say when you read a book, you read the black part, not the white part, you know? And I'm thinking to myself, I can do this. I can drink. So she goes off to work, and I'm sick. And I never threw up. But it was always like the stomach was like, oh, the head was. So I get out to the kitchen. And we didn't, I didn't drink much at home. We didn't have much booze at home. But there was vodka. And she liked orange juice. There was orange juice in the refrigerator. So I made a screwdriver. And I'm standing there, man, and going, I feel good. And I take a big gulp of the screwdriver. Well, the acid in the orange juice, I just, just barely got it down my throat because my throat was so raw from three days of booze. I mean, and I drank some sick stuff. Grandma and yay, maybe eight or ten after dinner. Forget to switch. I mean, that kind of stuff. Sick stuff, sweet stuff. And that, that orange juice was just so raw on my throat that I poured the drink out, and, 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 and then I didn't have a drink for uh, for seven months. When I was on vacation, came back, I went to the outpatient program. I got a sponsor who was a guy a guy that I used to drink with. He had five years at the time. Oh, everything was great. Seven months going along, and I'm coming up on my needle birthday in March. And I'm thinking, you know, if I'm still sober in March, I started in August. If I'm still sober in March, I'm going to reward myself. You know, I mean, I, I'd be entitled to it, wouldn't I? I mean, seven months of sobriety, March comes, and I rewarded myself. And I went on a four-day bender, you know. But then again, all the guys on the peninsula knew that I was in the program, or they assumed that I was in the program. So I went to San Francisco and drank. And after about a day, I was back on the peninsula, because that's where my homeboys were. That's where I needed to be. And, you know, the last day of my drinking, I pray to God it was my last day, it's the morning after the night before, you know, when you're trying to get better. I'm sitting in a bar in South San Francisco. It's 8 o'clock in the morning, and there's two other guys that I don't know there. They look as shaky as me. There's just three of us in this bar. And I'm the kind of drunk that would sit and watch the mirror or watch the front door so that I could see who's coming before they see me. You know, it's just an insecurity, just kind of a, a hick, if you will. And I look in the mirror, and up the walkway, who's coming? Not my wife, but my sponsor. <laughs> He had called, and she said, oh, he's out drinking, you know. He went around looking for me. And he comes in, he sits next to me, and he orders a Calistoga. We are talking. Now I'm embarrassed. I don't know what these two drunks are thinking, that my friend is, because he's not drinking like us. He's not one of the guys. He's going to kill. That's what I was thinking. I mean, after three days of drunk. And he, we talked for a while. He says, come on, I'll buy breakfast. He said, I'm not finished drinking yet. He said, fine. When you're finished drinking, call me. And he leaves. Couple of drinks back up. Now I'm sitting there and I'm not worried about what they're thinking. I'm concerned about what I'm thinking. Now here's a guy that professes to be my sponsor that I've shared personal things with. You know, a man loves a man as only a man can love a man in Alcoholics Anonymous as a sponsor, sponsee. And he walks out and leaves me sitting there. You know, I don't know what the hell I thought he would do for me, but he hurt my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a sensitive alcoholic. I told you that. You know? So now I'm digging son of a, you know, this guy leaves me just sitting here. I'll fix him. I called the cab, cab came, and I went home and I haven't had a drink since. And this past March that was twenty five years. So it works. It really works. You know, that'll teach him to leave me sitting in a bar by myself. <laughs> You know, I used to drink at my wife, you know how that story goes? Or maybe you don't, but I, I'd go home and ha having had a great day, I want to drink, you know, and I just can't say, honey, I'm going to go out and drink. So I'd start an argument. I don't need this crap, very dramatic, I don't need this crap. And I'd storm out of the house just so I can get to the bar. So I did that against my wife and I got sober against my sponsor. That'll teach you. <laughs> my life in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. I'm glad I, I didn't drag on with the sea stories. I wanted to leave enough time, and we have it. You know, my life in AA has been phenomenal, truly phenomenal. Sometimes I think to myself, my God, if I'd have gotten here when some other people who are younger than I got here, you know, no telling what I could have accomplished in life. But then I remind myself that I got here as soon as I could. It's just that simple, you know. Maybe if I'd have gotten here in 71, something else in my life might have happened. But I got here when I was supposed to get here. I believe strongly in a higher power. I was raised Catholic. I went away to be a priest for a year. You know? But I never understood spirituality versus organized religion until I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. 
And you talked about a spiritual program, not a religious program. You know, higher power, it was easy for me because I believed in God anyway. And I had faith. I didn't often have hope, but I had faith. And when I first got here, you know, you raised your hand. You said you had five years, ten years, eight years. You know, I couldn't relate to any of that. Tell me you got two weeks. Tell me you got 30 days. Holy cow, how did you get 30 days? You know, I mean, except for formal education and the length of my marriage, I had never done anything for a long period of time. And when I had one year sobriety, my dad was already gone. And my mother was down in Florida where they had retired. And my uncle lived down there who was also in the program. He had, I think, 12 or 13 years at the time when I had one year. He says passed. But I went down to Florida to see my mother. And it, coincidentally, I happened to have one year sobriety. And on a plane down, I, I meet a guy. And, uh, you, you know, you, you learn the buzzwords. You learn the signals. And somehow my seatmate and I just started a brief conversation. Somehow I got to alcohol. And he gave me the exact number of months or years that he was sober. I don't remember. And nobody knows that. You know, unless you're one of us. And I said, well, I have a year. Oh, you're a friend of Bill? I said, yeah. And, you know, it's like, wow. You know what I mean? I got to tell someone that I have a year. And he had longer, but it was a nice conversation. And all my life in sobriety, I've met people like that and had situations like that. So I get to Florida. And my uncle greets me. I'm at the house and all that. He said, come on. I'll take you to a couple of meetings your dad and I used to go to. So, okay, fine. You know, my father, really emotional, was kind of nice, you know. Because he never saw me sober. My mother did. My father did it. So go to a couple of meetings and, oh, you're, you're Jimmy so-and-so's kid. Oh, yeah, you know, I remember your dad. You know, those kinds of stories, you know. And it was nice. So we get a moment of pause between meetings or something. And my uncle says to me, he's a big man. He says, uh, uh, you have one year society now, huh? I said, yeah, you know, I'm puffy. He said, you feel pretty good. I said, I feel fantastic. He said, you haven't seen anything yet, he said. It gets better, and it gets better, and it gets better. Now, he's a big man, so I don't want to say this to his face, but I'm thinking to myself, what the hell does he know? He's got 12 years. That's great. i got a year, and it's so good. How can it get any better? He's got to be nuts. <laughs> of course, you know, the older I get, the smarter he got. You know, Of course, you know, it gets better, and it gets better, and it gets better. It gets real. It gets more real. It gets life. When you get to do life on life's terms. You know? And emotions, you know, there was not much crying in the Bronx. You know? <laughs> and God forbid I would cry in the Tenderloin. You know what I mean? I, that just didn't work. But when I got to AA, that's all I did. <laughs> so what the hell is this all about? I mean, I don't mean big alligator tears like the morning I was in the bed with my wife. No. You know, it's like moisture, you know, they well up. You know, it's like <clears throat> your voice cracks a little bit to you compose yourself. So what the hell? So I said to this friend of mine, a long time sober guy that I used to run around with, I had two or three years at the time, and this emotional thing was really bothering me. He said, eh, it's going to pass. You know, it's, it's just going through emotions. You get in your feelings. You feel your feelings now. You used to medicate your feelings. Okay, fine. I understood all that stuff. So we go down to this, to this uh, meeting in Pescadero, Saturday breakfast meeting, where the speakers always have 20 years. So whoever speaks has 20 years. So I had two or three years. And I go listen to this guy who's got 20 years. And during his chair, the guy cries. He said, I haven't got a chance. <laughs> this guy's got 20 years, and he's still crying. I mean, you know, what's the likelihood that I'm not going to be crying at 20 years? You know? And I still get emotional. And there's some days, depending on where my spirituality is at, where certain things in my chair just trigger those emotions. You know, they run deep. You know, we will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. And I believe strongly in that. I don't regret what I did. You know, because I did what I did. I'd like you to believe that the character defects that I exhibited to you when I was drinking are not with me any longer. But we don't lie in this program. <laughs> you know, I still have some of those character defects. And some of the lousy, stinking things I did as a drunk, I've done in sobriety. Not lately, but in early sobriety. We don't change overnight. We grow. And the difference is, you know, people used to say, I go to meetings to see what happens to people who don't go to meetings. Well, I go to meetings to see how to live my life, to see how you live your life. 
You know, when your child, God forbid, passes, or your parents die of cancer, or this is a bankruptcy, or you lose your house, or this happens to this one, you know, I see how you go through it with dignity. Yeah. I can't think of anyone who's had a tremendously difficult problem in their life that I'm close to, that we're in the meetings and shared that, that went out and drank as a result of that. I can't think of one. I've been here 25 years. You know, that's how I live my life. To see how you live your life through crisis. You know, anybody can live when everything is hunky dory in the pink cloud and life is great, you know. Sure, I can give you plenty of advice when my, my, have, when my home is in order. I can give you plenty of advice. But it's when I'm in crisis that I need to be able to hear things like that. So my guys that I had the pleasure of sponsoring all have gratitude lists. You know, and the trick is to remember to look at your gratitude list. You know, you can make those things that you're grateful for. Great, glad to have family, glad to have sobriety, glad to have God in my life. Whatever you're glad, whatever you're grateful for. But when crap hits the fan, you got to remember to look at what you're grateful for. That's what's going to save you. And this program saves you. You know, and, and Pat and I were talking earlier. I remember when he got sober with us on the peninsula. A couple of older guys took him under their wing. We used to give him a terrible hard time about the old times giving him bad information because they were too old to deal with his young thinking, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I was right. No. You know, but we were talking earlier, and the trick is this, in this program, especially if you're new, the trick is to get into the center of Alcoholics Anonymous, to get into service, to become part of. I'll bet you I had five years before I put both feet in AA, because it was always one foot in AA and one foot out of AA, because I thought you made me a little bit culty for me. You know, after all, Irish Catholic from the Bronx, I'm not going to just go anywhere. And I'm sober now. You know? But, you know, I have choices. But that's when I finally gave into alcohol. It's not as it became part of. If you're a hunter, you know, and you know the herd, the only animals that get killed are the ones on the outside of the herd. The ones on the inside never get killed. So if you get to the inside of Alcoholics Anonymous, you can make it. You can be safe. You know, and I was taught when I first got here, to hang around with the winners. And, you know, I didn't make that choice. I didn't know who the winners were. But thank God my first sponsor did. You know, and he hung around with the winners. He learned what was going on. And he took me through the whole process. Not the steps. I did that with somebody else. But he, man's man kind of thing. You know, he brought me along with guys that had long-term sobriety that he trusted and loved. And they taught me how to trust and love. I had made... Thousands of speeches, you know, all this politics stuff and all this business stuff. I had been somewhat successful. But when I got to AA, I didn't have to talk to another man. I'm 42 years old at the time. You know, well-educated by anybody's standards. But how do I have a conversation with you besides, hey, how did the Giants do today? Or the 49ers? Oh, the weather is. What do I say then? How does one man talk to another man? So when I got here, we used to drink coffee out of porcelain cups like you have back there. And we all smoked. And I would enter the ashtrays and wash the cuffs just so they can get around other men and watch how they interacted. You know, like a mimic. You know? And that's how I learned to socialize with people. You, know, you raised me in alcoholics. When I was 17 and started drinking heavy, that's when I stopped maturing. Yeah, and when I got here at 42, I was probably a 20 year old. Really immature. And you taught me what I am today. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.